as late as mid-February that the, the virus and more importantly, the, the public response to the virus was not gonna be as big a deal as it was. Uh, I, I was saying, oh, it might be two to three times worse the flu because it's new. I didn't imagine we would have national lockdowns uh, that really affected the economy in, in March and April. Now, what we got right, all the things that we've been saying for the last four or five years, that housing was underbuilt, that there was a lot of potential energy in the housing sector if governments just helped us out and let housing create jobs, I think has been proven true. And, and something that we said early, I mean, March, as we went into the downturn of 2020 was housing was gonna be, be the bright spot of the economy. Housing was gonna lead the way out. And not only has that been proven true, but it's been really reassuring to see that kind of narrative taken up by the Federal Reserve, uh, by folks in Congress, by the media. You will see housing listed as the bright spot. And I think it was really NAHB and you know state and local associations, everyone in the Federation making that argument. That's really important because for policymakers to see that and say, look, this is an engine of growth, an engine of job creation when we need it. I think that's, that's been uh, particularly good for the industry. Now, from a data perspective, we've been watching three kind of historic data signals that really indicate the strength of the housing market. One is the builder confidence as we measure here at NHB on the, what we call the HMI or a monthly builder confidence measure, uh, which comes out every month. You'll see it on CNBC, Fox Business News. It's at a level of 90 right now, which is an all time high going back uh, to 1985. I'll give you some of the reasons for that. Another important data signal, the median resale price. And so median just means typical. The typical price of a resale home right now is actually higher than the typical price of a newly built home. That has only happened once before in like the last 30 years. And that was June 2005 at the peak of the, the housing boom. It's, it's a clear sign uh, that we lack inventory in the market. It's something we've been talking about for years. And, and those low interest rates that came about due to the downturn really kind of uh, highlighted that factor. We've got currently the largest ever gap between new home sales and the production of for sale housing. Uh, that's the reason that builder confidence is really high. We've got a growing amount of backlog for builders. And that is going to have impacts on sales and starts as we move into 2021. Now, we, we know we have supply chain issues. We saw what happened to lumber prices between April and the third week in September. Lumber prices are headed down now, uh, but obviously delivery times, OSB pricing, there's a lot of different factors right now that are extending construction cost times or extending construction times and will increase construction costs as we move into 2021. Uh, NHB has been working on those, particularly on the lumber issue. We want more domestic production of lumber. We want a new softwood lumber agreement with Canada. Uh, we, we've gotten some wins on that, but there's a lot of work uh, remaining to be done. But overall, housing demand right now is really strong and it's because of what we call the suburban shift, moving to lower density, more affordable areas. I think that is something over the next uh, year, year and a half that's gonna benefit the Midwest in particular, I'll give you some data from that. The work from home and frankly, the work from anywhere trend I think is a good thing for residential real estate, for home building, for housing. It presents some challenges for commercial uh, real estate. And I think even though interest rates are gonna rise, they are historically low and as we've said for the last four or five years, we have really favorable demographics as the millennials kind of move into their late 30s and early 40s. So all these are bullish uh, signals for, for housing. And if we take a look at this is GDP growth just for the state of Ohio. Uh, so you can see we uh, kind of averaging about 2% uh, growth rate in 2018, 2019. The second quarter for the state was just like the second quarter uh, for the country as a whole. Uh, we had a negative 33% growth rate for the state of Ohio. For 2020, uh, we don't formally forecast it. My expectation is that for the year, the state of Ohio will have experienced a GDP decline of about 3%. And then we'll have a rebound like for the rest of the economy as we go into uh, 2021. So the second quarter was absolutely challenging. There are some forecasters who are now saying that maybe the back end of the fourth quarter or the start of the first quarter will actually see some weakness. And you know, if you look at some of the larger metro areas, places like California, uh, West Coast markets, uh, some of the upper Midwest, you are seeing renewed talk about um, not full on lockdowns, but kind of slowing the economy. Um, and and to stop the spread of the virus, whether that's effective or not, 
I think is, is open for debate. Uh, but the result is there will be some weakening uh, for economic growth as we move to the uh, end of the year. And, you know, here's the national data. I mean, you can just see the tremendous costs uh, that uh, the lockdowns had in March and April over the overall economy. That second quarter, which is that blue column there right after the 2020 line, Look, the first quarter we had a negative 5% decline, uh, but that second quarter it was more than a negative 30% decline. It was the worst quarter the U.S. economy had had since World War II, and it wasn't because of financial imbalances or economic balances. It was purely due to shutting the economy down. It's a, it's a reminder that government, uh, when authorized, can really shut down an entire economy quite quickly and have large macroeconomic impacts. The resiliency of the U.S. economy was apparent in the third quarter. Uh, with the reopening, uh, you have more than a 30% growth rate, and we didn't gain it all back, but we came pretty close. And so our forecast, you can see it there, we think it's gonna kind of weaken as we go into 2021, as we kind of work our way through the virus crisis. And then as a, a vaccine, which there are two, perhaps three promising vaccines, as they get deployed, and we think that will occur uh, at the latest June or July for those vulnerable segments of the economy, then we're gonna get some unlocking of some additional growth. And you can see our forecast, those blue uh, bars begin to increase as we get closer to 2022. That's the healing that's gonna take place in the hospitality sector, travel sector, as we get back to normal. It's not gonna be 100% of normal. I, I think the politics of this are complicated. There's gonna be a lot of, in some cases, signaling, uh, you know, think about after September 11th, you know, it fundamentally changed how we go to the airport. There's going to be some legacy effects of this, unfortunately, but I think we're going to get closer to normal. So if we look at the, the annual numbers, the U.S. economy in 2020 is probably going to be down about 3.6%. That's better than what we thought it was going to do, uh, say, back in March and April when we were looking at declines of at least 5%. So doing better than expected, that underlying strength of the economy. And then I've marked down just a little bit our 2021 and 2022 growth rates. We used to have them real close to three. Now they're a little bit below. The reason for that is kind of the election. And I'll, I will got to be careful about this because the stock market right now is actually kind of cheering some of the election results. The stock market's betting on divided government. The market's like divided government, a, a Republican Senate, a Democratic White House. The reason I've marked it down is that I do think we're going to see an uptick in regulatory policy using the Department of Labor, using the EPA to make policy outside of Congress, so outside that divided government. And we know from history that when that happens, the economy slows a little bit. And so we've got that, that marked down uh, into our forecast. Now, that, that stop and start process, uh, you know, I, I don't know what we're calling the, the downturn of 2020. I've been saying the virus crisis. One of my team members said, how about the great disruption? We'll see what we call it. But this, we found this in our, our macro model. We, we found it to be a kind of a good example of what the economy experienced. You can see restaurant sales there in red, grocery store sales in blue. Uh, in 2015, the two actually flipped as, as restaurant sales began to pick up and incomes went up and people were essentially eating out more than even the aggregate amount of grocery store sales. And then we enter 2020 and you can see what happens in terms of those disruption effects. Restaurant sales fall by 50% going into the spring. Grocery store sales surge. I think you all remember what it was like to go to a grocery store uh, in spring, you know, long lines. Uh, not necessarily empty shelves, but you couldn't uh, find everything that you wanted. And then the healing takes place as the economy opens up. And so you can see restaurant sales as they adapt through takeout, through limited capacity, it begins to climb and grocery store sales uh, begin to normalize. But you can see disruption effects and then permanent changes. There, it's not full in, so it's a partial effect, but it does produce a persistent change. And that persistent change in this case is that grocery store sales are now higher again uh, than restaurant sales. And so if we, we look at the, uh, you know, kind of the aggregates of the U.S. economy, you can see the same kind of disruption effects. Uh, the blue line here is, is goods in, in the U.S. economy in terms of goods sales. Uh, the red is services. And you can see, you know, V-shaped recoveries in these. But look, goods is now higher 
than it was at the start of 2020, and services are lower. And so this, this reflects the, you know, kind of the Amazon economy, people doing more things at home and ordering more stuff, for lack of a better word, and fewer services, so fewer travel, uh, fewer hospitality services. And that kind of disruption effect has favored housing. The, we're, we're more connected to the goods part of the economy than the service economy. The green, by the way, is structures. You can see it going down. This, we get this number with a lagged uh, data release, but the reason for that decline is non-residential construction. I'll, at the very end of the presentation, I'll show you the distinction uh, between residential and non-residential construction. Red line here is the unemployment rate. So now we're looking narrowly at the, the labor market. 6.9% unemployment rate. Uh, the good news is you know, we're well off the 16% rate that we saw in the spring. So that's a, that's a real win for the economy. Another win, by the way, though, was it didn't get up to 20 or 25%. Uh, there were some realistic forecasts that suggest we would have faced unemployment rates if we had really locked down you know, 90% of the economy unemployment rates that we last saw in the Great Depression. So we, we managed to navigate that, I think, uh, fairly well. And again, the resiliency of the U.S. economy, look how fast that red line comes down and how fast a lot of those jobs came back. So 6.9% unemployment rate historically, not too bad. It, it's bad compared to the 3.5% rate we had going in. Uh, but the challenge right now is that about a third of those who are unemployed have been unemployed for more than six months. So it's the long-term unemployment that's really gonna be the policy challenge as we go forward. Because after about six months, people's savings runs out. Um, they start to change their housing uh, plans, whether they're gonna buy a car, send their kids to college or community college, those big life type uh, challenges. So I think that's something that uh, both the, uh, a Republican Senate and a Democratic White House are gonna focus on is how do we help uh, the long-term unemployed uh, find work, uh, restore their savings. That's going to be a, a challenge here for 2021 uh, and 2022. But overall, we think, you know, the unemployment rate's headed back down to 5%. And I think we're going to get some good news that the Federal Reserve is really committed to letting the economy run a little bit hot. So we're going to see a little bit more inflation uh, than we have in the past. I think inflation will get up above 2%. It's been below that for a number of years. But the reason for allowing the, the economy to run a little hot is to get that unemployment rate back down to 4%. Uh, that's really where we want it. And that's going to help the rental side, the economy. And then eventually, if we help the rental side a number of years from now, it, it will help the, the for sale uh, side of the market. Narrowing in, if we look at uh, you know the job market in Cincinnati and Dayton, again, you can see the V-shape. Mm. By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the, these letter-shaped uh, recoveries in just a second. But, you know, the V-shape, uh, Cincinnati uh, MSA employment and Dayton MSA employment are only down 6%. Uh, that's better than the country as a whole, by the way, uh, which is down about 7% right now. Uh, but the recovery that is there, uh, you know, it's going to slow, as you can see on my unemployment line uh, in the last part. But, uh, you know, again, I think we're, we're doing better than expected. The footnote to those letter shapes, you know, the idea was for a while people were saying, okay, we'll see an L shape, which is the economy goes down and it doesn't come back up. Or a W shape, which is the idea of a really severe double dip recession. We could see maybe a little bit of a dip uh, in the first uh, quarter of next year, uh, depending on you know, how the virus uh, spread continues. Uh, but generally speaking, if you look at the historical data, we're looking at a V shape. And by the way, the other competitor to that is the idea of a K shape economy. This is the idea that one group of people are doing better during the recovery and another group of people are doing continuously worse. I will tell you that I kind of reject that K-shape uh, notion because the idea that there's a group of people who are doing worse and worse and worse, the bottom part of that K is wrong. Yes, there's a group of people who are not benefiting, but generally speaking, the economy's done a pretty good job of lifting things up. We need to make sure it's spread to everyone but I don't think you can make an argument right now that there's one group of people, a huge group of people, who are doing worse and worse uh, month by month. Another challenge in the labor market, and this is kind of the mismatch between employers who are looking to fill jobs and the fact that we've got elevated unemployment at the same time, the labor force participation rate really did take a big hit in 2020. Uh, you can see it was at 63% before we got into the downturn. It fell to 60 it's recovered to 61%, but that 
that 200 basis point gap between 63 and 61, it's a big challenge. And it's the reason that we do have ongoing labor shortages, despite the fact that we have about a 7% unemployment rate. What caused this? Well, quite frankly, it was closing the public schools in much of the country. Uh, you know, if you're talking about households that have kids, uh, one spouse or some relative is going to have to stay home to watch the kids, even if they're studying online. And the result is a permanent hit. Remember going back to that restaurant uh, and grocery store analogy, a permanent persistent ef effect on the labor force participation rate. So a full healing in the labor market is going to require two things over the next two years. And they both got to be done. Lower the unemployment rate and raise the labor force participation rate. We need more people out there looking for work. And there's some policy arguments that we can make in terms of trying to encourage that, but it is something to watch for. And it's something that the, whoever ends up as head of the Department of Labor is going to have some important tasks. And I'm a little bit worried that we're going to see uh, somebody on the far left occupy the Labor Department and interfere with this healing of the labor force participation rate. So that's something to watch for in 2021. All right, so if we put all this together from the macro side, here's our, our interest rate forecast. The 10-year treasury, we do think it's gonna go up, but it's historically low. So it's gonna remain historically low. But the big thing is, if you look at like 2013, you can see a kind of a jump up in the blue line, the 10-year treasury. That occurred back during something we call the taper tantrum. Now, this is when the Federal Reserve said it was going to loosen up on some of the support it provided the economy after the Great Recession, and interest rates jumped up by about 80 basis points. We could see something like that connected to the vaccine. So anytime we get another step in, in the right direction on the vaccine, you could see interest rates take a little step up. And I think that could happen because good news for the economy, better economic growth, more parts of the economy open, does mean higher interest rates. That's just the kind of a connection there in the macro side. So our, our forecast looks kind of smooth in terms of that blue line kind of going up, uh, but I think it'll be more of a, a stair step in terms of how it actually plays out. But why do we care? Obviously in, in housing, we care about where the 30 year fixed rate mortgage is. And I think that's gonna rise as well as the 10 year treasury, but it's not gonna rise as fast because there is a large gap right now between the 10 year treasury and the 30 year fixed rate mortgage that's due to a risk factor, that risk factor is gonna close. So over the next two years, uh, we think interest rates are gonna rise. I think the 30 year fixed rate mortgage is gonna remain well below 4%. And we know by the way, if interest rates on, on 30 year fixed rate mortgages get up above four and a half percent, get closer to five, that's where the market really begins to slow down based on today's home prices. So we wanna see that rate stay below 4% to help support housing demand. And I mentioned at the beginning, we got favorable demographics. Every economist uses some version of this slide. I use it pretty much in every presentation. It's just a reminder that generally speaking, the, the millennials, those people who are kind of between age 25 and 40 on this graph, the age there is the, the numbers at the bottom. There's a huge number of them. So you can see Gen X in the middle. There's not many of us Gen Xers, but there's a lot of millennials. And the majority of new construction is bought by 35 to 55 year olds. So as they age to the right, more and more people. Now, if you own apartment buildings, keep in mind Gen Z and Gen Alpha, which is the, the group after Gen Z, since we, we ran out of English letters, we'll call them uh, Gen Alpha. They're smaller generational groups that are like Gen X. So there will be some impacts on the rental housing market over the next 10 years as the number of young people go down. And by the way, that's also a challenge uh, for colleges. Uh, colleges really ramped up their capacity as the millennials move, went through the system. They're going to be dying for students as, as Gen Alpha uh, gets there because there aren't a lot of kids uh, in that generational group because of the low birth rates that occurred uh, right after the Great Recession. In terms of regional population growth, you know, the winners continue to be the mountain states. Uh, the south, Midwest is kind of flat. Uh, the northeast actually posted a population decline in 2019. The question is, you know, what about individual areas uh, within the Midwest? And I've, I've kind of put that here on this slide. You can see the, the U.S. growth rate being driven again by the South. That's the reason it's at a half percent growth rate. Uh, fairly decent. It's slowed, but it's, it's still growing. But look at Cincinnati and Dayton. They're doing better than, in terms of population growth than most Midwest markets, which is pretty flat. 
So yes, growth has slowed over the number of years, but I think there are markets in the Midwest, and I would include basically markets that lie along this I-70 corridor. Uh, you know, kind of going basically from roughly Pittsburgh uh, through Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, you know, kind of up hour plus or minus along I-70, uh, out through Indianapolis, St. Louis, and Kansas City that are affordable markets that as people can work from additional locations and businesses look to reduce their, their real estate costs, those markets are going to benefit in terms of business relocation and population growth. And losers are going to be places like New York, San Francisco, and Chicago. High cost markets where maybe the impact of being in those high cost markets for individual households and businesses is not as large as it used to be. So I, I think this suburban shift that we've been calling it is going to benefit the most affordable markets in the country. And that would include places like Cincinnati uh, and Dayton and, and Columbus, uh, quite frankly. Uh, home ownership rate, it's been trending higher since 2016. That's not a big surprise. Uh, that's really a function of the fact that millennials are, are getting in their upper 30s. Uh, that's when that occurred there in, in, in 2016. And if we look at the geography of home ownership, blue is Blue is good on this map, red is bad. Uh, if you look at California, for example, it's got some of the lowest homeownership rates in the country. Why? They price themselves out of the market. It's just too expensive to build there. So a lot of California home building now takes place in Utah and Boise and Northern Colorado. Uh, so, you know, the good news for the Midwest is high, relatively higher homeownership rates in the country as a whole. Cincinnati's at 74%, uh, Dayton's very close to 70%. So good foundations, uh, frankly, to build on uh, traditions of homeownership, uh, leading to relatively higher demand for, uh, for sale single family housing. All right, so let's take a look then at the, uh, the supply side. I, I mentioned lumber. Anyone in the industry knows what lumber prices did over the last uh, few months. You can see here in the data, uh, basically from mid-April to the third week in September, lumber pricing went up 170%. It was the fastest run-up in 70 years on lumber prices. I make the argument, not everyone agrees with me, uh, but I make the argument that the tariffs on Canadian software lumber made it worse. Uh, I will tell you, NHB uh, and, and myself uh, got to meet with Secretary uh, Ross at the Commerce Department uh, twice over the last three months. I met with Larry Kudlow at the National Economic Council, making the argument that housing is the bright spot. We've got to do something about lumber prices if you don't want that bright spot to flicker as we go into the fall. I'm not exactly sure what happened uh, because lumber production is not uh, up dramatically. It's up slightly. Uh, lumber employment, uh, sawmill employment is kind of flat. But whatever happened in the third week of September after that advocacy work, pricing has come down. OSB pricing remains elevated and other kinds of building materials are taking longer to deliver. Uh, but right now, lumber is about $550 per thousand board feet. We think it's going to be somewhere between 550 and 450 as we go into the spring. I would like a new softwood lumber agreement so we, we get more Canadian lumber. That's where we get about a, a third of it at a lower price. Uh, I think that that would certainly help. And, and ultimately, the, you know, the real goal is to increase domestic lumber production. That could be harder with a Democratic White House. Uh, we could have more environmental regulations that will make it difficult to harvest. And our, you know, our forestry policy in the United States is nuts. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we actually uh, brought in a, a German expert to kind of tell us what they did in Europe. And they couldn't believe that we basically say, don't cut down trees. Just, you know, let lightning burn down the forest uh, in Germany. That's not how they do it. And the result is their density of timber stock is about 25% that of the United States and the Western states due to environmental policy. So we need to bring sanity uh, to forestry policy. It would help uh, housing policy. I'm not sure necessarily we're going to get it, which is why I think trade policy uh, is going to be particularly important uh, uh, there. Skilled labor shortage continues. Uh, the red line here is a intensity measure of how bad the, the skilled labor shortage uh, is. It's gotten a little bit better. That's not a shock because we've got higher unemployment rates. But you know, at, at any given month, we're short two to 400,000 construction workers. So if we get a infrastructure bill that finances, it'll be mostly non-residential construction. One of the things I think NHB is going to fight strongly for is the idea it's got to have a skilled labor training component as part of that infrastructure bill. Otherwise, we go back to 10 to 12 years ago of shovel-ready projects. 
where we've got funding, but the actual real world is not ready to build these projects out. And so that disconnect between the, the labor and the materials and, and what the construction industry can actually do is going to have to be addressed. And, and one way of doing that is providing financing to, I would say, home building remodeling uh, to help recruit and, and train workers. So uh, that issue remains. Uh, it's more of a medium term challenge compared to the, uh, say, the building material issue, which is more of an immediate challenge, uh, but it certainly remains out there. And uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, you know, one of the things that people have said is, well, we've got a skilled labor challenge. We'll just build more homes and factories and the custom, or not the custom, the, the modular uh, format of panelized construction. You know, I, I've been saying this is more hype than hope. It, it works in some places and there are definitely good modular builders out there, uh, good panelized uh, firms. Uh, but if you look at the actual market data, uh, we went from 4% offsite to just 3% in 2019. So the market share actually went down. And if you look at 1998, it was actually at 7%. So the market share has been falling, uh, despite the fact there's a lot of capital flowing in, into the marketplace. Yes, I think we'll see some gains in, in 2021 in terms of offsite construction, but I don't think it's going to get up to 10% of single family starts. And, you know, uh, if we're talking about uh, labor shortage, offsite is certainly one area. Another thing would be broaden our our, our ability to recruit in the industry. And my team did some, some research showing that only 3% of construction workers right now are women. And I know a lot of local associations throughout the United States have professional women in building councils bringing women into the industry. Uh, in the occupation of construction, in the business side, um, you know, that is something that we can uh, uh, work on in terms of a goal over the next five uh, to 10 years. And we mentioned this in every presentation, but I think it's really important. Regulatory costs. I already kind of gave you some areas where I have some concerns, but keep in mind that you're, you're all leaders of the industry. If you're talking to policymakers at the local level, you're talking to your local congressman, remind them the regulatory costs drive up the price of housing. Uh, it represents about 24% of the price of a typical newly built home, and two-thirds of that arises during land development. So you know, if we move into a Biden administration and we're looking at things like a new waters of the U.S. rule, this is going to drive up those regulatory costs. And, and this comes from a, a 2016 uh, survey uh, and study that my team did. We'll be updating that survey and study in 2021. We do it every, every five years. Um, so we're going to be watching that. I think regulatory costs is the real political and policy issue for housing in 2021. And, you know, why does that all matter? Housing affordability. It's been on a small decline, uh, essentially for the last uh, 10 years. The good news for Cincinnati and Dayton, relatively uh, more affordable housing uh, on the new construction side included uh, than in much of the country. And this is one of the reasons why I think that suburban shift really is going to benefit uh, markets like, you know, again, through Kansas City, through uh, markets in Ohio, where businesses might take a second look of saying, do I want to locate in the Washington DC area? Or would I rather locate in Cincinnati or locate near Dayton, near the Air Force Base? Because housing is relatively more affordable. Uh, you can have a higher quality of life and it's going to be easier to bring workers uh, into those markets. So this is a real opportunity for the Midwest to aggressively recruit businesses. And of course, to recruit businesses, you got to have the housing in place uh, for those workers. All right, so we, we looked at uh, macro, we looked at some of the supply side factors, some of the demographics. So uh, let's take a look at the, uh, the forecast. Now, as I said at the beginning, builder confidence is really strong right now. Uh, the reason for that is we've got the largest ever gap between new home sales, which is the red line on this slide, and construction of for sale single family housing, which is the blue line. Uh, just as a technical footnote, this is uh, actually, a, the blue line is something my, my team constructed. It's hard to do. It doesn't come directly from the census data, uh, but uh, some research that we did a month ago, and you can see the gap between the red line and the blue line at the end of the slide. It's the biggest ever gap that we've had uh, going back actually uh, since 1960. So right now there's a huge gap between sales contracts being written and the actual underlying construction. So the backlog has gone up. And this means two things. New home sales are likely to slow a little bit because uh, the industry does not want to get out ahead of its skis in terms of signing sales contracts that can't be reasonably completed in a period of time. 
and single family permits are gonna have to grow. They've been flat actually uh, over the last couple of months in order to build out some of those ha uh, housing uh, that has a sales contract on it. Builder confidence, I mentioned this at the beginning, it's at a level of 90 right now, it's at an all time high. We designed this HMI measure as a forward looking indicator to tell us where starts are going. You can see the red line, it followed it down uh, when the HMI fell to a level of 30 in the spring. And my forecast, by the way, at that time was much more negative because I was looking at a real big decline in the HMI. And then as the HMI rebounded in that V-shaped recovery, we began to upgrade our forecast. And the result is uh, here. I mean, uh, 2020 is gonna be the best year for single family construction, uh, amazingly since the Great Recession, despite the, uh, the recession of 2020. We're probably gonna end the year up about 9% on single family starts. We think there will be growth in 2021 and 2022, but it's gonna be slower growth. And again, that goes back to that gap between those two things. Some of those sales are gonna to have to slow down to allow supply chains uh, to, to heal. And so you can see the impact of the great disruption in 2020, a decline, a rebound, a little bit of an overshoot. Uh, so then in 2021, we're gonna get an adjustment and then we get back to the long-term trend in terms of single family starts that we've, we've roughly been on uh, since 2011. Uh, so gains going forward, but not the kind of growth rates that we saw this summer and early fall. And then we'll look at each metro uh, in, in turn. Here's the Cincinnati data. Uh, relative to the Ohio data. Uh, look, you know, Cincinnati, an up year. In fact, uh, partial data thus far, but Cincinnati looks like it's going to end the year 16% higher on a year-to-date basis on, on single-family permits. So this is not just the political uh, city of Cincinnati, but the whole uh, metropolitan area of Cincinnati. Dayton, not quite as strong, only about a 1% gain. But I, I think both for Cincinnati and for Dayton, uh, given those affordability issues and the, 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 the suburban shift, I think both markets are headed higher as we go into 2021 and 2022. And some trends. New home size for uh, new construction. It's actually been going down for the last four or five years. We built more entry level housing. So the typical home uh, was getting smaller. I think that that size effect has now ended. Home size is gonna level off. And in fact, home size is actually gonna grow as we go into 2021. 2022, and the reason is simple. Our surveys, people want to use their homes for more purposes, to work, to study, to work out, all these activities that are basically taking roles from commercial real estate and putting them in housing, in residential real estate. That's gonna push uh, size up for new homes. And that's good news, by the way, for all our downstream providers that provide materials and appliances and design work and architecture work and financing, because each individual house is gonna have a larger economic punch uh, in terms of the economic impact of home building. And I've, I've been mentioning this you know, kind of consistently. I wanna give you a couple of maps to kind of prove my point of this idea of a suburban shift. Um, I may be you know, kind of beating on a dead horse here, uh, but the reason for this is back in May uh, and June, you know, we were making this case to journalists and there were a lot of groups out there, uh, Zillow being one of them, who said this was a marketing myth. There was no shift to lower density areas. Uh, there was no you know, kind of shift out of these, these high, air, high uh, cost, high rent uh, areas like New York and, and San Francisco. And the data is very clear. Uh, we were correct uh, and the data shows that it, it really happened. So what you're looking at here, the, the counties in blue represent the large metro core counties. They're about 18% of single family construction. Uh, the areas, they had positive growth rate, about a 6% growth rate over the last uh, four quarters. But as we move out, so now we kind of take a step out to the suburbs of those large metros, you can see the growth rate jumps up to about an 11% growth rate. So lower density, uh, better growth rate. And in fact, if we take another step out, uh, so this is small metro core counties. This, this would include uh, areas like uh, Dayton and Daytona, Florida. Uh, 30% of single family construction occurring in these areas, the growth rate goes up again to a 12% growth rate. So lower density, uh, better growth. And in fact, we take another step out uh, to these counties in orange, which represent the outer suburbs of small metros, a 15% growth rate over the last four quarters. So we use these as proxies. So I'm not saying that these are winners and losers in terms of individual counties, but it's what we see in the aggregate, which is home building, is growing faster in terms of single family construction 
in lower density, lower cost markets. And I think those trends are gonna continue as we move forward. And just as an example of this work from home uh, anywhere trend, this is some uh, new research that we put out. Uh, it's gonna be published on December 1st. Uh, I don't have any counties in, in Ohio listed on this map, but these are second home type markets where 15% or more of the local housing stock is a seasonal home. And you can see in the third quarter, these markets were up 23%. There's a lot of growth in terms of second home housing, uh, people you know, kind of working from some seasonal residents, particularly as baby boomers transition to retirement. So uh, we're seeing a lot of growth in those markets as well as uh, kind of traditional uh, suburbs. And oh, by the way, it's not just single family, it's multifamily construction as well. Uh, the, the counties here that are not in white represent small metros, rural areas, small towns. They're only 34% of apartment construction, but these areas outside the areas in white are growing faster in terms of multifamily construction. So multifamily construction is spreading out as well. More garden apartments, fewer high rises, fewer buildings with elevators. It's just a natural consequence uh, of the virus and social distancing and the amenities, quite frankly, that you get in large metro areas uh, like New York and San Francisco. So in terms of the multifamily data uh, locally, uh, Cincinnati, you can see the kind of the upper trend. This actually is bucking the trend that we see elsewhere in the country. So, you know, 2020 being an up year for uh, Cincinnati, multifamily permits is actually uh, quite good when uh, nationwide multifamily permits are down and starts are gonna fall, follow those permits uh, going into 2021. Dayton, not as much multifamily construction, so relatively flat. Uh, that's not a big uh, surprise there. And here's our forecast. Uh, so this is starts, this isn't permits, but 2020 is gonna be a down year for multifamily uh, construction. 2021 is gonna be even more of a down year because permits are down more than 10% right now. And we think that that construction weakness is gonna continue until we get to 2022 when it begins to stabilize and you see the rental housing market improve due to an improving labor market and a lower unemployment rate. And that, the geography and that cycle means that the kinds of multifamily construction that takes place is gonna change. Uh, we're gonna have fewer high rises, uh, the 50 plus unit share, which over the last two decades has gone from 15% of multifamily to more than 50%. Those blue columns are gonna shrink and we're gonna get more of that missing middle, more of the purple and the green uh, as we move forward. So multifamily construction is going to spread out. It's not going to dominate in the suburbs, but there's going to be more of it and, and more of this kind of low rise development. The remodeling market uh, can, should continue to be strong uh, going into 2021 and 2022, particularly as existing home sales pick up. And in fact, that red line is the actual quarterly data. It's actually off our trend line right now. So it might be the case that we need to upgrade our forecast uh, for the remodeling market. Limiting factors for remodeling are, are cost and, and labor, uh, as they have been uh, for the last four or five years. And then just to, to wrap up, this is the final data slide, and I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, the blue line here is residential fixed investment. Uh, the red line is non-residential uh, construction. So basically, you're looking at a blue line, which is an aggregate measure of housing, single family, multifamily, remodeling. You can see the V-shape. Uh, you know, our, our decline, we got back to where we were in less than a year in the housing industry. The, the non-residential construction sector is probably going to take four to five years to get back to where it was at the start of 2020, absent some large infrastructure bill. So this is the flip of what we saw in the Great Recession when the economic pain was concentrated in housing. Now it's concentrated in commercial and hotel development, non-residential development. And so that sector is gonna take longer uh, to rebound and get back to where it was. So housing really is uh, the bright spot of the economy right now. Yes, we've got economic challenges in terms of building material costs, labor issues, but given the fact that we expect interest rates to remain low, demographics are, are positive and the geography is moving in the direction of lower density markets where home building is a greater source of supply, these are generally bullish indicators uh, for the industry as we move forward. And uh, that uh, completes my presentation. I, uh, I think I saw some questions pop up. So uh, unless Dan or Eric objects, I might uh, take a look at, uh, let's see if we got any questions there in the box. 
Let's see, we've got uh, Eric uh, thanking sponsors. So I uh, hope everyone can see that in the, the, uh, the group chat. And thank you again, the sponsors. Um, can you receive a copy of the deck and the recorded version? I'm not sure if you all, it looks like you're recording it. Uh, I will make sure I send Dan and Eric a PDF copy of the slides uh, so uh, everyone uh, can see it. And then Eric uh, said, you mentioned NHB working on a lot of fronts and the advocacy side. What do you think are the biggest areas we'll see wins? Where are we going to meet with a, a great resistance? Of course, the executive officer is asking this question. This is why you guys pay these guys to be thinking down the road like this. No, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, so Jim Tobin, uh, you know, is our chief lobbyist in NHB. Jerry Howard's our CEO. They're the politics guys. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the numbers guy, but you know, I live in DC, so let me let me put on my my registered lobbyist hat, which I, I have as well. Yeah. On the on the Congress side, it's it's going to be deadlock. Uh, the the framers of our country were geniuses. <laughs> this is something I I feel really strongly about. Madison and Hamilton, and everything they knew what they were doing. The, the idea that an election could suddenly just change everything. The Senate is going to be the great break on dumb ideas, and so you know you're going to hear a lot of of policies that are going to be pitched to one extreme or another extreme, and Mitch McConnell being Mitch McConnell is going to look at them and let them die on the shores of the Senate. <laughs> and then, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of kind of deadlocked things. So I'm not expecting big changes in tax policy or any kind of legislative policy. Infrastructure could be the one area where you could see some, some uh, areas, I, you know, maybe an expanded child tax credit. That would help housing demand, by the way, particularly for households that have kids. Uh, an earned income tax credit benefit, I know that's political. Uh, but that could be one way of helping to fix the uh, the, low, uh, the labor force participation rate. So that those are some areas where Congress uh, could work. My concerns are on the regulatory side. The idea that some of these government agencies, the Department of Labor, the EPA, the Department of uh, Interior, HUD, when it comes to the affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, rule, could bring back regs that we had fought off in 2015 and 2016, and they're going to come back. So waters of the U.S., the joint employer rule, uh, independent, uh, 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 independent contractor misclassification. These are all issues where, frankly, the, the, the deck is stacked against us. And so, you know, we're watching right now. I think we got a great uh, uh, treasury pick. Uh, Janet Yellen is a friend of housing and home building. Uh, we've met with her every year with the NHB senior officer team. If you have a Democratic White House, I don't think you could have had a better pick than Janet Yellen. That's uh, Joe Biden as the moderate. I am concerned about who's going to end up in labor because the progressives are going to want their pound of flesh and they haven't gotten their pick yet. And I'm, I'm a little worried that it's going to show up in environment and labor. So that's where I am. And oh, by the way, I should say the other side, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is also an ally of housing and home building. I think Chairman Powell has been a great Fed chair. We meet with him every year. I, I meet with their staff quarterly. They understand that housing is how you get an economy to rebound. So they're going to let rates remain lower for longer. And I think that's that's good news. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So Dan typed in the, the webinar uh, being available. So uh, I don't see any additional questions. If uh, anyone else has uh, other uh, questions, feel free to enter them into the chat box. Otherwise, uh, I'll open it up to uh, Dan and Eric, unless you guys have any uh, remaining thoughts. Rob, what kind of impact do you think foreclosures are going to have? Closures and evictions. Those are the two things that sort of waiting for the both shoes to drop. Uh, foreclosures, look, yes, there's going to be an uptick in foreclosures in 2021. We, we, we see the seriously delinquent rates from the Mortgage Bankers Association data up. My expectation is we'll probably see about two to three million foreclosures in 2021. That's bad. It's not catastrophic. I don't think it's enough to cause home prices to fall. Uh, I think the market can absorb it. We're short millions of units anyway. Um, it, it's a policy challenge for, for those who, who are, suffer through foreclosure. And I think there's probably some policy help that will come along. So I'm not massively concerned right now about a foreclosure crisis. We're going to have to deal with it case by case as it happens to help those people out. But I don't see it as a systemic uh, threat. Evictions are a challenge, but I will tell you there's, there's some numbers out there about evictions that are hot garbage, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, there were some policy groups talking about 40 million evictions taking place. That was never going to happen. That would require almost every renter, in the half of renters 
in the country to uh, suffer some kind of eviction? Could we see millions of evictions when the moratorium uh, goes away? Maybe, but it really depends on the labor market. That's why we need to make sure that unemployment rate comes down as quickly as possible and get the labor force participation rate up. So I think the, the evictions is the greater risk. Uh, and it's the reason that we have declines for our apartment construction forecast. But we think home prices are going to continue to grow at least as, if, as fast as inflation as we move into 2021 and 2022. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, TJ asked, do you see any lagging impacts of the unemployment rates? Long, super long run effects. If you look at where unemployment is concentrated right now, it's unfortunately among the youngest millennials and the oldest members of Gen Z. Uh, because this, this downturn affected the service sector, it affected younger folks more than it affected older folks. This is the reason you're going to see a lot of discussion about student loan uh, forgiveness, because these are the people who also have high levels of student loans. Now, I will tell you, as somebody that went to grad school for a long time and had student loans, I'm of mixed mind on student loan forgiveness. I paid mine off. I did a lot of millennials. So there's kind of a fairness issue. That's one-on-one. -on -one. The other thing is more of a macro policy issue. So if you get into a debate over Thanksgiving over student loans, it would help housing demand because those people would have less debt and they could go get a bigger mortgage. But all it does is encourage more people to go to four-year institutions. And my wife's a college professor, so I can't say this too harshly, but we're probably sending too many people to college anyway. And so if you're giving this big windfall to people that went to college, aren't you hurting the people that went to community college with no student loans, or went to a trade school and never built up student loans in the first place? And who do we need to help the most from just an equity perspective? Is it rich kids that went to college? or is it people that went into the trades? I'm concerned about that. And it, student loan forgiveness could be a big giveaway to people that live in Seattle and New York and Washington, D.C., and it could hurt much of the rest of the economy in a relative stance. So that gets a little complicated. So if we're thinking about lagging effects, it's the income effects and savings that come from the unemployment being concentrated among young people. Uh, let's see, Charles Sims asked, what are you asking for Christmas for home builders? <laughs> are we in the circle of trust? I know we're recording. A, a labor secretary that gets it. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get it, but that would be, I am I'm really concerned about independent contractor status. Um, you know, we'll, 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 you know we'll, we'll have to watch these, these uh, um, cabinet picks come out yeah, and we, we'll work with, with whoever, but uh, I if we're going to repair the labor market, we need to repair all kinds of, of activity in terms of employment and that W-2 employees and includes independent contractors as well. I'm a little bit afraid of kind of a union push that goes too far. So uh, that would be my, my, my Christmas wish. I, I don't have good luck getting my, my Christmas wishes. So we'll see. Um, what are the chances of uh, Se Secretary Sanders or Secretary Warren getting Labor Secretary not? Okay, well, Dan, you're you're, you're anticipating. S Secretary Sanders, uh, Bernie Sanders wants to be uh, the Secretary of Labor badly. Uh, if, if I'm on the Biden team, and you can see who he's picked so far for state and for defense and um, uh, treasury, they're moderates. Uh, he doesn't seem like he would fit in in a Biden a team. But then again, you got to kind of, if you're a Democrat, you got to appeal to all parts of your, your party. So uh, let's let's hope uh, that we get somebody who may be a mayor or a governor who has local policy uh, experience, who knows the pros and cons of, of going too far on labor policy. That's that's where I'm worried about an overshoot. And then TJ said, uh, please speak to the reasons you forecast a reduction, a large reduction in multifamily projects and increase in smaller multifamily developments. It's just geography. Uh, it, I, you know, people want more space. And so it's going to be cheaper to build those low-rise multifamily structures in the outlying areas uh, and, and essentially reverse some of the kind of the trends in American economic history where you have lower income people living closer to the urban core. They're going to start moving further out. We see this, by the way, in the D.C. area. A lot of low-income workers who used to live right in Washington, D.C., they've moved far, far out to places like, and this probably is not going to mean a lot to you all, but Dale City or, you know, kind of 90-minute type drives.
outside the DC area. And the reason is you're seeing more apartment construction and townhouse construction in those outlying areas. So I think the structural types of multifamily construction, it's still gonna be 60% in the core, but maybe go from 33% in those outlying areas up to 40%. And you're not gonna build a 20 story high rise in an outlying area. You're gonna build a two story wood framed garden style apartment that has a door straight to the outside. Because frankly, that's what renters are gonna want. They don't wanna spend time in an elevator. And I, again, I, I'll tell you as somebody who lives in Washington, DC, but is from Ohio, I've been to New York, I've been to Washington, DC in recent months. A 30 story elevator ride in this environment uh, is, is not the most reassuring thing. And to do it on a daily basis is, is gonna hurt multifamily de demand uh, in places like Chicago and New York. Uh, let's see, Walt, uh, any thoughts on climate change agenda and its impact on housing? So as an economist, I'm a, I'm a data guy. I, I, I keep looking at the forecasts for climate change. They're always somewhat exaggerated and never quite come true. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing my bias here in terms of, I will tell you, uh, as somebody who loves this industry, I think climate change from a political point of view over the next 10 years is our biggest uh, risk whether it's flood insurance, environmental rules, uh, they're gonna wrap up forest fires as well. Um, I think this is something the industry needs to do some real serious thinking about in terms of what are our strategies? What are we, what are we willing to work with? Who are, we willing to, who are we willing to work with? Because I think this is something, and the Biden team has made it clear it's a priority by putting former Senator and Secretary of State John Kerry as their climates are that we're gonna get a lot of focus on climate change over the next four to eight years. We, we need a, a more uh, comprehensive strategy than simply no. Um, and uh, I think that's something I'm gonna push for here at the NHB level. I, I think at the state and local association level, we need to be having discussions about that, particularly when it includes things like uh, you know, land development and uh, flood insurance. Uh, Charlie Sims asked, what about building in urban cores? I think it's still going to go up. It's just going to grow, you know, so here we're talking for single family townhouse, close in, uh, single family, uh, you know, multifamily in the urban cores. It's going to grow, but it's going to grow a lot slower than what we see in the uh, traditional suburbs on out to the exurbs and the rural markets. And that's going to happen for the next two years then it will partially reverse. When we get a vaccine, you'll start to see some of those people that doubled and tripled up with roommates or the New Yorker that moved back to Ohio to live with their parents and will get, head back to New York at some point. Some of that will reverse. So again, the reason I use that restaurant grocery store slide was to illustrate a theme, which is some of these things are gonna roll back, but they will leave persistent effects. This will be one, it will roll back, we'll see some housing demand return the urban cores, but I think it's gonna be permanently weaker than it was. And the reason why is technology. We accomplished 10 years of change in terms of allowing about 40% of the US workforce to work at home full time. And according to our survey data, about 60% of that 40% expect to work from home at least half the time, even beyond a vaccine. And if that's true, that is a real bullish indicator for home building and remodeling. So it's gonna hurt commercial real estate in those urban cores. It's gonna benefit home building and existing homeowners that have housing. And a, a slide that I took out, uh, something that we're likely to see some gains, it's not just multifamily construction that's gonna benefit in those outlying areas, but single family built for rent. It's only about four or 5% of the sector, but I think that share likely will go up to six or 7%. Uh, over the next couple, uh, next year, year and a half, uh, because there's a lot of people that want a single family house. They want a yard for their, their puppy <laughs> that they got during quarantine or for those kids that they're gonna have after there's a vaccine. They don't wanna live in a 1600 square foot apartment, but not everyone can afford the down payment to buy a home. So single family rental will also have a window of opportunity here uh, over the next 18 months. And then I think it'll kind of more normalize as we get into what will be the new normal. You know, I'll mention one other thing, you know, because of the vaccine and the virus are really what's driving 2020 and 2021. There's a lot of people who are saying we're going to get a vaccine. Things are going to get back mostly to normal. Maybe we'll still have areas where, or large events where people have to wear masks or, or something. I'm not sure. Right? That's not my area of expertise. 
but the idea that people are going to buy real estate with the idea that there won't be a public health crisis five or 10 years down the road, I think is wrong. So just because we fix the coronavirus doesn't mean that the next one isn't coming. Uh, we had Ebola six years ago. Fortunately, that time it didn't break out. It almost did. Didn't break out. We had SARS in 2003. This seems to be something that comes out of China a lot or in, in some cases, Africa. So if people are making long run investment decisions on real estate that they buy for, to hold for 10 or 20 years, they're going to be buying with mind of what happens when the next one comes. And so I do think there will be some persistent partial effects that last, that affect the urban cores uh, after we get out of this. And with that, uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, Eric or Dan, if you guys got anything else, I'm happy to take it. Uh, we had one more, Rob. It looks like uh, where do you see interest rates leveling out once the economy begins to steady? Our forecast model suggests that we should see the 30 year fixed rate mortgage get up real close to 4% over the medium run, which is kind of a five year type forecast. We don't have a getting to five. Um, and I think the Fed, again, is going to be an ally. Here's the thing, though the Fed has really great control over short term interest rates, and they're going to keep the Fed funds rate at zero, uh, probably until at least 2024 but they don't have as great a control over the long run rates. And that's where mortgage rates are determined. So if they begin to pull back on quantitative easing, which is the purchases of treasury bonds and mortgage backed securities, we could see those mortgage rates begin to rise. As a builder, as someone maybe investing in land, I would get concerned if you start to see that 30 year fixed rate mortgage get close to four and a half percent. That would be the moment to say, okay, how solid is, is my demand in front of me? You could, you could proxy it with age. You know, what, what share of my buyers are, you know, between 25 and 35? If it's high, those are the buyers are going to pull back first. So you might want to pull back and be a little less aggressive. If you're working with mostly older buyers doing large end custom, uh, you know, I, I think the interest rates could get as high as 5% before your, your, your business gets there. But I don't think we're going to see above a 4% 30 year fixed rate mortgage for at least the next two years. So we've got a, talking to Dayton folks, we've got a long runway here in terms of the aviation analogy in terms of liftoff for, for interest rates. And I think the Fed through the combination of Chairman Powell and now former uh, Fed Chair uh, Janet Yellen at Treasury means interest rates are gonna kept low. The negative effect of low interest rates though for a long period of time, higher inflation expectations. So we're going to see it in building material costs. And don't be surprised if you see CPI get above 2%, uh, maybe even as high as 3% over the next 24 months. So uh, for your own wealth strategy uh, purposes, you might be thinking, yeah, inflation is going to be a little bit higher. And by the way, that's the reason the stock market's up so much. Uh, the stock market's going up because people recognize that you know, holding cash is probably not a particularly great investment other than as a reserve. Uh, to buy the dip or uh, if you need to uh, kind of, you know, rely on those resources. Well, thank you, uh, Rob, and everybody that participated in today's webinar. We really appreciate it. We will uh, be posting both the slides and the recording on our website. I'm sure Dave will be doing the same thing. Uh, that, look for that in a, in a couple of days. Uh, I did want to again say, uh, express a, a, a thanks to all of our sponsors, and I also wanted to announce who the winners are of the $50 gift certificate.